May the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father be with all those that are in need to uh, be outside uh, under this uh, weather. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is a matter of life and death. It is about faith. And here we are praying together, ready to hear your voice. Through your humble servant, and particularly from the text. Lord, help us all together to be willing to listen and to receive your word this morning. As I again praise your name for those present, we pray for those who were not able to join us this morning. Lord, guide us through your Holy Spirit and cover us with your mercy by the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. It has been a uh, wonderful learning following the 2017 Lenten devotional meeting Jesus. I'm personally still amazed at this imaginary first person <coughs> testimony. And in the last two weeks, not to mention since uh, we started uh, on Ash Wednesday, we have heard about the Gerasene citizen, Jairus, the woman healed of leaving the young boy whose lunch was multiplied to feed thousands, the Canaanite woman, Peter, John, the man healed of blindness, the expert in the law, Lazarus, the woman healed of a creeping disease, the Pharisee host, and the man healed of leprosy. How about they would have explained meeting Jesus? Regarding symbols, let me remind all of you about also what we have learned about the peacock as a symbol of immortality or life after death, the fish as a security pass code for gatherings of the believers, remembering that the first disciples were fishermen, the anchor and the pelican as the living, life giving act of Jesus' crucifixion. And today, is Martha's turn explaining her take on her brother Lazarus that was resurrected by Jesus that is only mentioned in the Gospel of John. Uh, let me make an uh, interesting point uh, here. It's not necessarily the first time that Martha met Jesus. Uh, they were already friends. They were already uh, very close. But nevertheless, it's her take how she approached this miraculous uh, event of the resurrection of his brother. If we move to the next uh, uh, slide, Bonnie, please. We have two artistic renditions on how that event might have looked like. The first image, this one that you're looking at, is closer to the Hebrew tradition to wrap cor corpuses versus the next one showing the Egyptian <coughs> mummification style. If we move to the other one, body please. This is what it looked like if the Hebrew tradition at this point in time in history would follow the Egyptian uh, mummification <coughs> culture, but it's not the case. It is it is a previous one that is even present today in the Jewish tradition. The core, it's wrapped in, in white clothes. Uh, the the body is not dressed. The body is na naked. And if we return to uh, the previous one, body, this is more closer to the Hebrew tradition and not the, the other one that may look like uh, as, a, as a mummy. Even though we just have read, you know, that uh, 
Lazarus were wrapped in stripes. But as uh, that was part of the uh, edition uh, of the text at that point in time uh, later. But this is more uh, closer to the Hebrew uh, tradition. If we move to the next one, uh, Bonnie, please. There are so many different types of tombs in the Holy Land. This is one of the pics I took in January of 1990 during my trip to the Holy Land. And, and you can see clearly one of our, uh, this, uh, he was a, a student at Princeton uh, Seminary, how difficult it was to get on that particular tomb. And the rolling stone was kind of a sphere that was not pushed. And, and you can notice how they carved it in the stone to make room for that uh, spheric stone to then uh, close the, uh, that, that particular tomb. But most of them were a uh, cave on the stone. If we move to the next one, this is another one uh, in the city of Jerusalem, uh, next to the uh, King David's Hotel. This probably may belong to a richer person. You know, it's kind of a walk-in uh, tomb. Uh, there's uh, Professor uh, Charles, uh, uh, Professor uh, James uh, Charlesworth, a New Testament professor at Princeton Seminary, give us the explanation, and you can see a kind of a wheel-shaped rolling stone that can be moved, and even you can see the arch over there to accommodate that the stone. So whatever was the case when Jesus said, remove the stone, it could be at least one of these two uh, forms uh, of uh, shapes of a, uh, of a tomb. Not all the tombs were kind of a walking closet. You know, as, as you can uh, realize from uh, the previous stones. The, the next two uh, bits are other uh, tombs that have been uh, already found. If we move to, to the next one, body, well, now you can see again the uh, wheel shape that it can be moved, but no, no arch, no other protection. And you can notice exactly how they carve into the stone. And in the next one, body, please. Not necessarily a very a perfect uh, round shape and a wheel shape, a stone, but at least uh, a big one to cover this particular uh, tomb, in which you can really, of those who had bodies and tomb over there, is kind of a, a walking uh, eye. Uh, some of you have uh, recently uh, either uh, seen an article or read an article about how the, uh, the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre uh, in Jerusalem has been under renovation, in, renovations in, and is now uh, open uh, to the public. Uh, for years, a uh, tomb like this was believed to be Jesus', Jesus tomb. Uh, but uh, after uh, that, uh, it was an English general, and by the way, that tomb is uh, named after uh, his, after him, but it was not accepted because it is not uh, related to the position of the uh, walls of the city of Jerusalem uh, at the time uh, of Jesus. So it's still, for most scholars and archaeologists, it is accepted that the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre, now within the old city the, uh, of Jerusalem, it's the uh, most uh, accepted uh, place of where Jesus was uh, entombed uh, before his resurrection. The text, even in this long, there are a couple of verses that caught my attention. Verse 35, one of the shortest in the scriptures, both uh, Old and New Testament. Jesus wept. Almost all versions agree on this translation. I went through different translations of different Bibles, and almost all of them concur in this translation. Jesus wept. In Greek, 
it would be a dry descent of Jesus, web of Jesus. The dichro in Greek is, is a tear drop, properly to shed quietly tears, to weep silently with tears. And I also felt uh, compelled for this, this particular translation and this particular understanding that Jesus is not crying out necessarily. He is weeping. He's dropping tears. He's moved. He's really moved. In, in this particular case. And probably, if not the only one, at least one of, one of the few in which Jesus is shown with this particularly a very human reaction. In many ways, this is the kind of Jesus that I, I reflect more on and I can make a personal reference on as, as a friend, particularly during a funeral or a difficult time that is close to me, that is next to me, weeping with me in solidarity. That's the really kind of Jesus that I, that I feel every time I'm going through a difficult time. Verse 37 is the second one that caught my attention. But some of them said, He gave sight to the blind man, didn't he? Could he not have kept Lazarus from dying? Almost all versions agree on this translation. In Greek, it would say, Anoxias to ophthalmos. Sounds, sounds familiar? Ophthalmos is for eyes. So we have uh, problems with our vision and with our eyes. We make an appointment with the ophthalmologist. Anoxias to ophthalmos. Tu tiflon foi sai, kainai kei otus me apotani. Having opened the eyes of the blind that have caused that also this one should not have died. What an interesting relationship I found and I shared with you between weeping as an eye-opening experience and the eyes. More than the physiological connection is the meaning of a spiritual eye-opening experience. When you and I finally said, I can see clear now, the rain is gone. <laughs> I can see clear now. When my eyes are open to perceive the spiritual meaning. The 2017 Lenten devotional describes Martha's impression of this encounter with Jesus. My brother Lazarus fell ill, so we went, we sent for Jesus. Lazarus died, and still Jesus didn't come. Four days later, our dear friend the rabbi who could have healed him with a single word finally approached me. I ran out to meet him. I wanted to believe Jesus knew what he was doing, but this was my brother, his friend. I knew I would see Lazarus again at the resurrection, but Jesus told me that he is the resurrection and the life. Mary fell weeping at Jesus' feet. We went to the tomb and God's anointed one, the resurrection and the life, broke down in serves right alongside us. The stone was rolled away. Then Jesus prayed. He called Lazarus by name. And my brother woke out of the tomb, still wearing great clothes. I owe at what Jesus is capable of doing, constantly continues to grow. In chapter 10, 
the Gospel of Luke is the only one telling us about Jesus visiting Martha and Mary. Mary is the one that chose to listen to Jesus while Martha kept busy with house chores. We just had an opportunity to, uh, to study this, this uh, particular uh, text this past uh, Wednesday during our, our Bible study that also was included in the uh, Lenten devotional. Now the Gospel of John's account of Lazarus' death, Martha, the one that chose the bad part in the previous visit, seemed to have learned the lesson, affirming her belief that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Though she stumbled, expressing her concerns about the corpse's odor after four days that prompted Jesus to say, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Sister Mary expressed her frustration. Mary, the one who chose the best part during the, that visit uh, in, in the Gospel of, of Luke, Sister Mary expressed her frustration, telling Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Because they, before, both Mary and Martha texted, sent the text to Jesus, your dear friend is sick. Believing in Jesus, after having met him, my sisters and my brothers, is indeed a matter of life and death. It is not a matter of no longer being afraid of death, but it's a matter of being aware of the assurance of eternal life despite the odds. Unfortunately, Lazarus' resurrection was not enough to prevent Jesus' martyrdom just weeks later. If anyone would want that miracle for a loved one during a funeral, it would not prevent you to see your loved one dying again. We don't have that uh, part of the story in, in any gospel. Whatever happened to Lazarus afterwards? How long he stayed alive before dying again? What was Martha and, and Mary if they were still alive by the time that Lazarus died again? What was the, their faith? What was the, the situation? What was their reaction? And we are reminded again on this fifth Sunday in Lent, my sisters and my brothers, without death, there is no resurrection. Without death, there is no resurrection. We would probably love to see our, our loved ones probably after a powerful sermon or a miracle worker present at, at the funeral to make our, our loved one raise from, uh, from the casket. And we will be happy and probably some uh, people will, will be afraid of, of seeing that wonderful sign. And we might be frustrated saying, why Lazarus was single out? Why any of us have received that kind of a miracle? Because that's not the point. The eternal life is not a life to be lived on earth. Eternal life is a life to be lived in heaven. Without death, there is no resurrection. Jesus in himself was tempted. And the crowd was shouting out, If you are indeed the Son of God, 
come down to the cross and save yourself. Jesus could do it. He had power to do that. But he knew how important was that kind of a sacrifice in order to give us now the hope of the resurrection. Without that, there is no resurrection. Faith in Jesus, my sisters and my brothers, is indeed a matter of life and death. It is a matter to overcome the pain of losing a loved one. But it's a matter to reach Jesus' promises and the power of His resurrection. Let me share with you briefly about two other words that come from one of the words on, on verse 37. When people were asking why Jesus who gave sight to a blind man could not have been uh, saved, Lazarus, and bring him back to life. And particularly the word about that, there are two in Greek. The first one is nekros, that means Dead, being dead. Are you familiar with the word necrology? When there was a, a, a ring or a list in remembering a number of persons that have died recently, or there's a, a particular explanation or a bio or theology about a particular person, and the other word is thanatos that refers to specifically to the death, to death, Thanatos. That's, are you familiar now with that uh, moral and ethical discussion about euthanasia? You know, to kill himself or herself. Thanatos, death. And also, in some places, cemeteries are called necropolis. Necrom, the dead, and polis, city, or the city of the dead. I remind you again, my sisters and brothers, about the three important questions that this daily Lenten devotional putting us to reflect on. How did you meet Jesus? How much do you know Jesus? And third and final, what and how much do you want to give up in order to keep following Jesus? Please join me, if we move to the uh, final slide, please join me and let us all repeat together today's emotional summary on Martha's experience in his brother's resurrection and we'll say, Jesus, you hold the power of life and death. Help me to trust in your power and time. May God help us, may God show us your mercy his mercy and love every single day. Amen.